Hi there. In this second video, I'll be looking at some of the appointment methods that are used to appoint judges worldwide. I'll be focusing on what I've called here regular appointment methods. That's to say, appointment methods used to appoint, select, elect, nominate regular judges. I'll cover the appointment of judges who serve on apex courts in a subsequent mini lecture. I think broadly we can think about three different ways of recruiting judges. There's one very odd category of judicial elections. And then we've got a distinction between career judiciaries and recognition judiciaries. And that distinction is from an article by Georg Apkolos uh, from 2000. And the distinction is pretty well recognized. Um, I'm going to take you through each of these methods in turn and talk about them a little bit. I should say that although I'm going to talk about all three different methods, uh, elections are by far the least common method of recruiting judges. So we think about these judicial elections. Um, they're most common in the United States, uh, not just um, for the initial appointment of judges, but also uh, for whether judges are retained. And these elections can be carried out with party labels or non-party elections. So you could think uh, in some states for some judgeships, there might be an election straight from the off and you might uh, have an election to decide who fills a vacant post or you might only have retention elections that's to say judges might be appointed by some other means a judicial nominating commission for example they might serve for three or four years and then they might go up for a retention election so there's lots of variation um, when it comes to the finer details of these elections for state first instance or appellate judgeships. In terms of the other countries that use elections for judges, there are some Swiss cantons. Again, you know, not, uh, not federal judges, not judges at the national level, but judges at the local level. Um, and there are some national exceptions, but they're super weird. Um, so in Bolivia, there was a 2009 constitutional reform which created elections uh, for uh, different apex courts, including like a, a court for the environment. What happens is that the, the legislature filters uh, candidates for these courts and produces a long list and voters then rank candidates from that long list. Oddly though, uh, candidates can't campaign <laughs> in these elections. So it's, it's super odd. Um, I guess uh, people are supposed to you know, learn very soberly about these candidates for judicial office without the dirty business of actual campaigning. Um, in Japan, again, theoretically, there are retention elections for its Supreme Court, um, but no judge has ever been removed by this method. People have to actively vote for judges to be removed and that's never happened. Uh, there are lots of studies which suggest that elections do matter. Um, so judges who are closer to re-election tend to be more punitive. Uh, they, also, they tend to give longer prison sentences than judges who are further from election. They also display somewhat predictable biases. So when it comes to tort claims or claims for damages, they make larger awards against out-of-state defendants. So if you're in you know, Delaware or whatever, and you're bringing a claim against you know, a company from Michigan, then you are more likely to get a big payout if the judge is subject to re-election than if they're just straightforwardly appointed. So there is evidence 
the judge's behavior is somewhat different. Um, and these elections have become much more important and much more expensive. So the judicial role has become much more politicized since the 1980s at the earliest, um, certainly from the, the 90s and 2000 onwards. And that, as well as you know, creating consequences for judges' behavior, might have damaging consequences for what people think about judges. The probably the most common way of putting judges on courts is not through elections, but through career judiciaries. Judiciaries where people basically act as judges for their entire working lives. You can you know, say when you're at school, you want to be a judge when you grow up and you can do that. And that's because typically selection for the judiciary begins after university education and law with some kind of competitive examinations. You might want to compare these to something like the uh, examinations for the civil service fast stream in the UK. Now, when we talk about selection for the judiciary, I don't want to create the impression that people are coming you know, almost straight out of university and suddenly deciding cases. Typically, you know, a judicial career begins with time spent as a judicial assistant, working with a more established judge, assisting them to reach conclusions in particular cases. After that time spent as a judicial assistant, you'll move up the ladder. You will engage in some kind of career progression. And that career progression can involve moving between different regions in the country. So uh, in the same way that if you're working for a, a big company, you might have to move between different regional offices. That's true also for career judiciaries. You might get reassigned to the head office, let's say the uh, the judicial district or the judicial region in the capital city. Or if you've done something bad, if you've annoyed someone, then maybe you'll get moved out to somewhere in the sticks, somewhere in a rural area far from where all the action is. And perhaps for that reason, uh, one of the criticisms of career judiciaries is that judges are not independent of their superiors. So there's low individual independence because judges are always having to look up in the hierarchy, trying to work out, well, you know, who are my superiors? Who potentially has some input on whether I get promoted or move to another region of the country? So there's that low individual independence you know, possibly with high collective independence, it might be that the judiciary as a whole is able to be quite independent of politicians just because senior judges keep junior judges in line. So that's one criticism. One of the benefits of career judiciaries is that they do tend to be quite cheap. Um, there's no need to compete with the private sector because you're not recruiting people from law firms. You're not recruiting people from private practice. You're recruiting them typically straight out of university. And although you might not be offering them a very good salary, you typically are offering them a guarantee of job security. The state as an employer is never going to go bankrupt. And so your company is never going to have to sack you because of downsizing. Another potential advantage is that career judiciaries can be quite meritocratic. If you have some kind of large scale uh, competitive examinations or large scale recruitment methods, these can operate without regard to what university you studied at, what gender you are, uh, whether you, know, you have a high social profile, whatever other irrelevant characteristic you might want to consider. These 
career judiciaries do often coexist with court systems that are regionalized. So people gain experience moving between different regions, working up the ranks and court systems with specialized courts so that individuals can develop some kind of specialization through their career. The big contrast with the career judiciary is what's known as a recognition judiciary. And here the key characteristic or the key idea is that judging is not a career on its own. Judges are only appointed to the judiciary after a first career where they've achieved some measure of recognition. Typically, this means that you get appointed to the judiciary after you've been a lawyer. You've been a lawyer for 10, 15, 20 years. You've had some measure of success. You've been recognized by different people. And upon achieving that recognition, you decide, well, you know, I'm moving into a different phase of my career. I want a little bit more job security. I want to become a judge. You do, however, have some recognition judiciaries which recognize academic contributions to the law. And so uh, recognition judiciaries tend to be uh, a little bit less diverse in terms of their pre-appointment experience, um, but you do get some academic contributors. One of the ways that you recognize the recognition judiciary is that they also have recognition bars, that's to say hierarchies of lawyers. In the UK, we have uh, this distinction between not just between barristers and solicitors, courtroom lawyers and lawyers who prepare cases. We also have this distinction between Queen's Counsel in other jurisdictions known as senior counsel and all other lawyers. So it's very much a way of recruitment which relies on fine gradations of distinction. And appointments are generally for advertised positions which are held for life or until individuals are promoted. So you don't get moved around. You apply for a position and once you've got it, you're there until you retire or until you move up. Judges in these systems can be expensive, in part because you're competing with private sector employment. So if you think about uh, barristers in the UK, in particular the top barristers, for Queen's Council, your annual income before tax, before expenses, can be of the order of £1 million a year. If you want to become a High Court judge, that means that you're going to take a pretty big drop in salary because High Court judges' salaries are 200000 a year. So you could be giving up uh, up to 800000 a year in income. Uh, granted, you know, from that one million a year that you might get as a top QC, you do have to pay lots of expenses. Uh, you would have to provide for your own pension. Um, you wouldn't have the expectation of job security, but still you're probably going to be giving up some considerable portion of your income. And that means that the UK government at the moment, particularly over the period 2019 to 2021, has been struggling to fill high court vacancies. Um, so although individual judges are expensive, you do recoup some of that because relatively few full-time judges are appointed. Uh, and that's you know, partly to do with the way that deputy high court judges step in and partly also to do with the way that barristers in England and Wales and in these kind of adversarial systems typically do more of the work than, let's say, lawyers and inquisitorial systems. I'll come to that distinction between adversarial and inquisitorial systems in a later lecture. If you're thinking about how to assess these career and recognition judiciaries overall, then it's important to note that they've got quite different character. 
I've got a lengthy quotation here from Bell in his book on judiciaries across Europe. And he's talking about how if you visit criminal courts in different Western European countries, judges look and behave differently. In Sweden, the young judge in the Tingsret will be in ordinary clothes, sitting on a panel with lay assessors, probably even older than her parents, at the same level as the prosecutor, defence lawyer and the accused. It's more like a meeting than a common law trial with everyone joining in. In France, the three women judges, one middle-aged and two younger, will be in robes and a days, raised above the accused and his lawyer, whilst the English middle-aged trial judge is even more formal, wearing a wig and raised above everyone. So these different ways of uh, recruiting judges have very different characters and that also feeds into something that I'm going to discuss in the next video which is how we get judges onto the very top courts.